Okay. This afternoon, <coughs> I want to introduce something that has helped me a lot. <coughs> and it's a concept that I'm going to share with you <coughs> at the end, but I'm going to start talking about it now. <coughs> Excuse me. The Hebrews have a very interesting way at looking at history. Now, how many of you enjoyed history in school? Good. Few of you did. Why? What was it about history that you enjoyed? <clears throat> My history teacher talked about the Civil War. He actually came in with a uniform. Okay. So in other words, kind of, all right. Yes. Now, let's get something straight right here and now. I'm still in school. Okay. Okay. Do I count or not? Sure you do. Because I love history. I can read it by the hour. Why? I just think it's just, it's so interesting to see how mankind lived and solved problems without all this electronic stuff 150, 250 years ago. And... and I'm just enamored by, by, and also, if you don't look to the past, you won't know where you're going in the future. Okay, you just said what I was going to say, and that's good. Okay? The problem is, is that we tend today treat history as somebody else's story. And it isn't. It's God's story. It just got a lot of people in it. Okay? And when we start seeing that, you say, oh, okay, all right. Now, that's, why, that's why it's his story. Yeah, that's right. It's his story. Okay? But the bigger issue is <clears throat> the way that we look at history, if we sit there and they say, well, that's their, their problems. That's how they dealt with it. We deal with it differently. Surprise, surprise. No, it isn't. We do it just as poorly as they did. We just don't think so. And the, the thing that I want us to catch here is that as you look back, okay, and I'll, I'll use the illustration, I'm going to bring it up visually so you can see it. They believe that you're in a rowboat and you back into the future. Okay, that's how they think. And the way that that works then is, is that as you're in a rowboat, you're focusing on something behind you to make sure you're going straight so you're going this way. Okay. Now, I was talking with Carl, and he says, well, I did the backstroke, and I had to look at the line on the ceiling. Well, okay, well, either way, the, the point was, you're not looking behind you, you're not seeing where you're going, but you're following the, the way in which the lines are going, or the line of history is going. And so when you start seeing that, then you say, okay, you can see things happening there, and you say, okay, that's going to lead to, and you have a pretty good idea, better than if you were just turning around and going, okay, I'm going to go that way. And then you're forgetting what's happened in the past, because what's happened in the past has led to the future. See? And this is what we miss. So what will happen is, is that when you read your Bible, the, the, the stories are actually foretelling bit by bit things that are going to start pulling together. Okay? And I'm going to present what I think might make that some sense. Uh, and the reason why is because God has always said, I will not do anything without telling my prophets. And I've always wondered what that looks like, and I'd like to share some things with you on that. We've talked around, we didn't even talk about Abraham, and, I, and that's fine, because we usually spend a lot of time on the story of Abraham, but we really don't get into the Isaac, and more importantly, the Jacob thing sometimes, because... I don't know, it's just interesting. To me, it's amazing because, as I've said more than once, Jacob's family is the most dysfunctional family I've ever seen in print. I mean, there's just all kinds of things when you start realizing it. You've got four women. You've got two sisters. You've got two secondary wives. And you've got ten boys. And if I'm correct, and I could be wrong, so I, I wouldn't want to say it, 
strongly here. But these boys, some of them are like only one year's one year apart. And so it would suggest the idea that you have boys, 11 of them, before Benjamin, that are like 15 years old all the way down to one. Now ladies, I know that you struggle with boys sometimes. Can you imagine having 15 in the household? Now, as to ages, I can go anywhere. But you've got to realize that there's 15. Now, there are daughters, but we don't hear about them except for one. And that's Dinah. Okay? But my point that I want to make here is, is that you know when you've got that many boys, boys tend to want to win at something. <laughs> you know, and it gets really scary when you've got 15 of them. No, I'm sorry. Not 15. 12. That's what I want to get. Okay, so what I want us to understand here a little bit is how in the world is God going to take this group, this family and turn them into a blessing? That's the job. That's what they signed up for. And that's what they're doing, trying to do. That's what the birthright's about. That's the reason why they exist. And all that stuff. And yet you go, I don't see, I don't see the daylight here. It just doesn't look like it's going to work out here because... They're fighting, and they're fighting about a bunch of things. So, let's see what we look at. Helps if I turn it on. Alright, the first thing I want you to look at is this. I've referred to this, now I want you to see it. What happens here is, is that you have God at the top, the top blue line there, and that's God's ideal. That's the way God created man, and Garden of Eden, and everything else. That's the way He intended it to be. The problem is, is that Adam and Eve, by free choice, chose to disengage themselves from that. So they disengage from God by making the free choice of, I know what God said, but I think I can do just as well making my own choices. Which then only leads to the second generation, which says, okay, um, it just gets that much worse. And as you recall that last slide that I showed you, that it started out with the idea of uh, making a choice and then it actually goes all the way down to blaming other people. And in the story of Cain and Abel, it starts out with blame and it's just jealousy and it goes all the way down to murder. And my, my theory that I'm sharing with you is this. When God starts with Abraham, he, this is his response back to what's done here. And I find it very interesting that God allows sin to develop to such an extent to where the flood is needed. Why would you do that? And as a teacher, I sit there and I say, well, what I would do, uh, this is my explanation for why I would see this happen, is that, okay, you think that it works. Well, I can tell you it's not going to work. But the kid's not going to sit there and say, well, I I don't do it, I can do whatever I want, you know. And that's us. I mean, we, we did that when we were kids too, right? So the idea being is that sometimes you have to just let the kid find out for himself if it didn't work. And I think that's what God does. Not that He wants them to do the bad thing. But remember, He has to honor our free will. He refuses to take that away. So there are certain things that we want to learn. So notice what happens. Adam and Eve disengage from God in a way that they, well, now they're on their own. Well, they got to deal with that. But then the next one, they can't get along even as siblings. So now it's starting to get really, you know. So, and then it goes all the way down to Noah's generation, and now everybody's doing that. That's what's right in their own eyes, and it just it gets uglier and uglier to the place to where it's, it's just evil continually. And so I say that God seems to be saying here by the way that he allows these things to happen is telling me that this is the natural order of what happens with sin. And when you see that kind of thing happening, then you say, okay, so what's what's the solution? Well, there's a flood. And we hear that. And that takes on a totally different meaning, at least for me, if we look at this chart, and then he says, okay, now there's a flood. After the flood... What's really interesting is that Nimrod and the others basically say, hey, 
You know, we've always had problems with God. Let's just leave him out. We'll just, just we'll make our own world. See? And that doesn't work. And, and we can get into why God you know, con, uh, confuses the languages. And that's actually a good thing. But we don't have time to get into that. So I'm just going to leave that there. But I want you to go all the way down. And then, Genesis 12, God starts out with Abraham. Abraham comes out of that bottom rung there where it says there are people ignore God with the idea of the Tower of Babel. And God and Abraham says, no, I don't want to be a part of this. Now you need to realize that Shem is, I don't know how many times, grand, grandfather, is still alive. He's still alive. So in other words, he can tell them stories. Well, this is what it was like before the flood. This is what it was, you know, this and this and this. He knows what they're, and so that's it. So when they start building their own thing, as you saw in the creation story, they'll talk about the flood, but notice who they blame for it. See? They blame God for that. You know, that man made mistakes. You know, you know, they were drunk and they didn't know what they were doing. And I'm going, really? How do you worship somebody that does that kind of stuff? I don't know. I, I don't know where they get that idea, but that's where they went. And as I said earlier, the Babylonian gets even more violent. You know, when they go over there. So you've got that kind of stuff to work with. So now God starts with Abraham and he re reconnects with God. He and Sarah, actually, there's you know, kind of faith. And then he takes two sons who are about to kill each other and reconciles them. Now, do you start seeing how God is proving his point through the, the family of Abraham by showing that there's an alternative. And I like the way God does this because a lot of people don't think that God gives alternatives. He's giving the alternative and He shows the difference. So in the book of Genesis, you literally have these two pathways. You can see either the way of sin or the way of God. And you can see it side by side. Now, what you would expect towards the end of that is you'd like to think that somehow he's going to kind of tie this together some way. And the point is, I'm going to suggest that what you see here is, is God's going to, to take a family, he starts with Abraham, and he gets it all the way down to Jake, uh, Joseph, and then Joseph's going to be able to pull something together in such a way to where they can then go down to Egypt, grow into a nation population, and then become a church, if you please. And then go out and be witnesses to the rest of the world. That's what I see. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe you go, but that's how I see that. Because I see patterns. I see similar things that are happening like that. And so, what I want us to catch here is, what, are we, what is Joseph about? What's different about Joseph? Because all the other uh, uh, patriarchs, have used deception in their lives to perpetuate God's plan as they see it. God can't deal with that. Okay, He's shown that again and again and again. Hagar is not the one. Ishmael is not going to be the son. It's going to be something that God himself is going to provide. When it gets to, to uh, Isaac, you know, God uses... Abraham and says, take your, your son, your only son, Isaac. And the reason why is because he's showing, and you know, we've always connected the offering of Isaac with Jesus. We've always done that. And that's some of the foreknowledge. I just think the foreknowledge goes to that much more. So, and so he has that. Then Jacob and Esau, this is where the brothers are starting to fight with each other and all that kind of stuff, and you think that something's going to be lost. But he's able to reconcile them. And he does it by having Jacob experience what he's been doing to other people. And so when you start seeing how that happens, then he said, no, I don't want to do this. God's going to do this all the time. He does this over and over and over again. So he uses Joseph, uh, Jacob and Esau to make this thing work to reconnect. Now, if, if there's a pattern, and, and I'm throwing it out there, that if there's a pattern, then what we see is, is that Joseph is going to do something that actually pulls this whole family together, somehow, some way. So when you read the story, you say, well, okay, let's just check it out. So let's do that. Okay? 
So the first thing that I want us to say here is Joseph is an atypical patriarch. In Genesis 41, verse 38, he is the first to have said to have the Spirit of God. Abraham doesn't get it. Joseph, uh, Jacob doesn't get it. He's called, he had the Spirit of God. I don't think that that means that the others didn't. I'm saying that there seems to be something that's special about what Joseph's going to do. Whereas the other patriarchs are seen to have haven't fallen short, Joseph seems to have overcome their failures. We want to catch that. Joseph is striking an example of one who responded in trust and obedience to the will of God. Is there anything that's said about Joseph that's negative? It doesn't seem to be at all. And yet the others are very clear. Now, I want to show, uh, build that up just a little bit farther. There are a few comparisons in Joseph's story with other characters that reveal how we might see the gravity of this story. So, for example, took a look at the simulation here. Dependent upon God to know good and evil. Adam said God's word concerning the tree of, of good and evil. Joseph makes decisions based upon God's will and his honor. Do you see the difference? Adam sits here and he goes one direction. Jacob says, no, no, we're not going to go. We're going to do it this way. And so we see that kind of thing. But it gets even more so than that because he's made the vice generate. Here's the interesting part. Adam was the vice generate of the earth. He was said that this is your land. I'm, you know, you're in charge. But notice, how many times is Joseph been, uh, elevated to the one that's over the land? He's originally at Jacob's home. He's going to be the, the leader of that. He goes to Potiphar's house as a slave and he raises up to the number two guy. He goes to the prison as a slave and he ends up being in charge of all of the prisoners. He goes to Egypt and answers the, the, the dreams and he ends up to number two in Pharaoh, under Pharaoh. Now, do you see where Joseph is now put in a place on a regular basis where, uh, where authority is and he is doing righteousness. There's no mention of him doing anything that's, that's wrong. That, that doesn't mean that he's not a sinner. It just simply, that's how the story is told. Now, the other thing is, is that God gives Adam Eve. Joseph receives an Egyptian princess. To make a lot of, of this kind of stuff, I wouldn't, that little part at the end, it's nice, but I don't see significance necessarily, other than the fact that, again, there are things that say, well, that's kind of different from the way I saw this, and I, you know, this kind of thing. And so it gets us to thinking in the mind of God saying, okay, you've seen what sin does, watch what happens when I get in charge. And that, when you start seeing a general thing. So anyway, so there's that kind of stuff. Now, here's the interesting thing that I, I caught was really interesting. And that is the contrast between Eve's reaction to temptation versus Joseph's. Take a look at it. Eve sees the tree that's good for fruit, sees the tree is pleasant to the eyes, fruit desired to make one wise, takes the fruit and shares it with somebody else. So what happens when Joseph is tempted? What does he do? He, he avoids it. He runs away from it. He does all that he possibly can. And finally, he's, there's a confrontation. And interesting enough, this is what he says. He says, my master has given me all things but you. Now I want you to think about that. Okay? He, he knows where he belongs. He knows who he is. He says... But then he says the most amazing thing. How can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? What would have happened had either Adam or Eve had said that? Think about it. That's what Joseph says what Adam and Eve should have said. Oh, we be needed. See, this, this is it. Okay, now, so I start seeing these patterns here. The third thing is he ran away from Potiphar's wife. That's not what Eve did. That's not what Adam did. Okay? So I see some patterns here. So 
when, when, when we start looking at this, Joseph seems to be good. Now, where would he have gotten information like this? And we understand that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. Does anybody know what the other book was? Deuteronomy. Well, yeah, he, yes. There's another book other than Genesis through Deuteronomy. Huh? It is. You're absolutely right. If you look at the book of Job as if you were looking at it, that Moses is writing this, is there much difference between their experiences? Really not that much. He's out in the wilderness. He's trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, And I've got an article I'm going to leave with you. And you may copy this, whatever. It's straight out of a, a Spirit of Prophecy. And it's it's a, a article that she wrote that you only see a portion of in the Patriarchs and Prophets. And when I, when I read that, I started to realize just what it is that I, I told you about. J- Jacob. God had to help Moses understand what Jacob needed to learn. And, and it's just very, very interesting. Um, but anyway, but I want you to catch this idea that there's these kinds of things that are happening um, to Jacob and then down to his, his son, Joseph. We are not told that I know of anything that was specifically transferred from Jacob to Joseph. We know that he spent time in his father's tent. We know that he got a special you know, thing, uh, a jacket or that kind of situation. So there was that. But we're not told what would have been um, transferred between father to son. It would seem that he would be telling the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as probably um, the things that they heard about you know, Cain and Abel and, and all of those kinds of stories as well. Um, we're just not told, but they seem to be acting, and that's all the word, that's as far as I can go with them. I, that would be assumptions. Okay? But I see this constant re, re, uh, going over the same ground, God's way versus man's way. And so what we start getting into is something that we need to talk about, and that is the brothers. We need to realize that the brothers is something that we do better at than Joseph. We, we struggle with that. And I'd like for you to see them in a little different light. You need to realize that they observed how their grandfather treated their father. And how he did business. How did the Laban do business? Oh, I, this, this guy was merciful, merciless. He changed uh, Jacob's salary ten times. He takes and puts Leah in the wedding uh, suite as opposed to what was organized, written down, and remembered that it was supposed to be Rachel. Okay? And this guy is constantly just shrewd as all get out and selfish as all get out. How, does, how, does it, how do we live in an in a environment where a man like that is consistently treating people? You ever worked in a place like that? Okay? That affects you. That affects you. Okay? And the first thing is that I would think of is that you got to protect yourself. You got to watch your back. You got to look out for you because nobody's going to do that for you, okay? And so there's that kind of a situation where they struggle with that. So there's the unfair treatment. What do you do when you watch your mother, your birth mother, seemingly being treated better or worse than quote the favorite? Wife. Now, let's face it, polygamy just doesn't work, okay? You know, it just doesn't work at all. And yet, in this case, what was jo- Jacob supposed to do? Was he responsible for, for the, the fact that he ended up with two wives? I'm just asking. I, I'm just. No. I don't really think so. And yet, on the other hand, 
why couldn't he just sort of say, well, okay, well, I'll just accept Leah. I wish, you know, I love, you know, Rachel, but I guess that's it. I mean, it isn't, you know, think about it, because Abraham went with a second wife of sorts. That seems to be whatever. I, I, you know, I don't know what to do with that one. It's, just, it's rather interesting. But at the same time, you start realizing these boys grew up watching mom get second seconds. Yeah. And that's hurtful. That's hurtful. And that's not, you know, in, in one sense you could say, well, Jacob, you could have done better. And I think so. But at the same time, you still got to realize Laban is one that, that, that pulled this stuff. He really did. You know, and, and how you deal with it, I don't know. I, it just, I, what I'm trying to point out here is that life was complicated for them too. It's easy for us to sit there and say, well, you know, that's really nice. You know, in the Bible, you kind of knew what was right and wrong and all that kind of stuff. But now, today, uh-uh, sorry. It's just as complicated and sometimes even worse. Okay? And so, you know, you've got this situation. The ongoing jealousy between Leah's sons and Rachel's sons. I mean, this is crazy. You want to talk about jealousy. I mean, this is bad news. And, this, and you've got numbers. You've got, what, eight? No. You've got ten boys. You've got ten boys that come from other wives. And father likes Joseph better. Or at least gives more attention to Joseph. How are you going to deal with this? I don't know. Maybe, you know, sometimes I've, I've met up with kids and said, well, you know, I'm the one of the family here. You know, and, and that's hurtful. But that's sin. That's, that's based upon on uh, ways in which God says, no, don't do, don't do that kind of stuff. But they did it. They, they dealt with that. And then facing God on the way to, to, to meet Esau. They'd never met him before, these boys. And all of a sudden, you know, here comes that. We've heard about Uncle Esau. And then they watch how that affects their father, and they see this stuff. He changes. He, you know, he's the victim with Laban, but now he's the aggressor with his brother, and he's going to face him, and that's scary. So, what do you think of these boys? Just general overthink. I, I mean, uh, there's some of the stuff that we've shared that just kind of we're assuming certain things, but. How do, you, how do you deal with a family like this? How, how is God supposed to, to reach these brothers? What do they need to see? A change in their father. Change in their father? Okay. Change. Okay. So, what kind of changes might that look like? Equal treatment. Equal treatment? Okay. Anything else? I say this because once we get into the story, I want us to be able to look back and say, well, maybe that fits or maybe it doesn't. But we now are going to be able to see how it develops. And that's what I want you to start looking for. Look for process, people. Look for process. God is faced with a particular situation with his people. And he's, he's got to address it. How is he going to address it? How is he going to bring them back to unity? How is he going to do this? Because that's going to teach you the kind of character that God has and the plans that he has for you and me. All of a sudden, when you start thinking that way, I'm not thinking about the bad things. I'm thinking about how, how great it is to watch how God is able to save us. See, because when we say save from, what are we saved from? Well, we're saved from sin. Okay, well, that's really nice and good. But what does that really look like in real life? You know, I haven't been a murderer. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't done all that kind of stuff. But I'm a sinner just as the next guy. So what am I being saved from? See, and how does he do that tells me what kind of a person God is. Yes, he's divine, but he also wants us to know him. You know, Jesus says in John 17, he says, to know God is life eternal. Wow. 
I can go for that. That sounds like a really good thing. And if you understand God as he really is, you would want to be wherever he is for eternity. I can do that. that I like that kind of concept. But if we don't know him, or if we totally misunderstand him, what heaven's going to be like? It, it's not going to be heaven. I just, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here a little bit. I'm thinking saved from self. I think that's right. I think that's really what it is because that's exactly what went with sin. Sin became about us. Now I have a sheet that I'm going to hand out to you that will blow your mind. It is the best definition I have ever seen that explains the self. It was written by a guy by the name of Landon Gilkey and the book is called Shantan Compound. Shantan Compound was in China during World War II where the Japanese rounded up all the expatriates that were in China at that particular, in that particular area and took them to a uh, vacated Presbyterian uh, mission with had wide, high walls around it. And there was enough uh, buildings inside and all that kind of stuff. And the Japanese said, okay, look, here it is. Here's some tools and you've got to organize yourselves and do all of that kind of situation. And there was no hierarchy in that. There was no military man at all in there. All they had was, is you had missionaries, you had businessmen, you had lawyers, you had Trappist monks. These are the ones that just hold themselves up in a, in a carol and just spend total thing like that apart from everybody else. They had Russian circus performers. All of this stuff. And what was really interesting was, is he said for the first eight months, he says, hey, you know what? Who needs God? Who needs God? Look at how, how proficient we have by organizing ourselves. We, we've got women doing this. We've got people that are doing, uh, they're taking care of certain things and the men are taking care of other things. And we got people in the cafeteria and we got people who are doing this and all this kind of, and it was looking really good for about eight months. And then all of a sudden people started showing their self-centeredness. And his conclusion was, if man can't live outside of himself, in other words, if he can't get past self-centeredness, people just destroy each other. And he describes the process, and I will give you something that will give you something to read and think about, but it is literally the best I have ever seen that I feel comfortable sharing with somebody else and saying, I think that's the best definition for selfishness. And what, how it gets started and why it starts and why it just keeps continuing on and how bad it gets and how much it affects every single day of our lives. Okay? So, if that's the situation then, take a look also at the next trial and there's the next one, the loss of his wife. Joseph loses his mother and his brother is, you know, I don't know, I, I, my guess is like maybe one or two, something like that. That's kind of way across unless somebody knows better. But, but there's that. That's it. Mom's gone. Okay, so now there's no one other than Joseph, uh, Jacob to protect these boys from what goes on when daddy's not around. See? Now, not only that, you have the situation where um, these boys have gotten really mad at dad because Dinah, their sister, by the way, there were more sisters than this, but this is the only one that's mentioned, so that tells you something. She goes in, and it looks like she goes out on her own, and she wants to see what the other girls are doing in Shechem, which is a Canaanite city. And somebody likes the way that she looks and takes her and attacks her. And dad doesn't say squat. There's nothing there. He doesn't say anything. Can you imagine what those brothers felt? And they come straight out. They sit there and they say, dad, you, did, you didn't do nothing for our sister. And so again, you see how sin multiplies as time goes on unless you arrest it. Okay, so we're starting to see that kind of a situation that's happening here. And finally, 
then Judah meets up with Tamar. And that's an interesting story, and we'll hold it for a little bit later. Now, I'd like to hear from you. What, what do you see happening in lives, families, situations where we're not really dealing with the sin problem. We're just kind of looking out for each other or, or in, in certain ways, but in other ways we're not. What, what is our problem that we look to God? What do we really want God to change in our lives to where we could get along with each other? Our hearts. Our, our hearts. What do you mean by heart? How you view others. Okay. Having respect for other people. Value other people. Um, getting our eyes off of ourselves and what we want or think we need or should be doing and, and put them on other people and realizing that as dysfunctional or sinful as we are and obviously everybody else is worse than me that um, we're all we're all God's children okay so how are we doing why why aren't we doing why, why can't we sit there and say, well, you know, I mean if you can describe it that way I mean what would happen if society actually bought into this and actually started acting like this What's keeping us from doing that? Yes? Human desire. Okay, so now we're talking about desires. Okay. I, I, I think the idea of using the term, what's in my heart, <coughs> but that's just an area. And, and the term desire is, is something that everybody has for something. I like to draw it a whole lot. Here we go. Okay. And uh, I think the root of it all is human desires. It, it becomes sinful. And, okay. And and w- once we can develop a desire like Adam and Eve had before Eve was deceived with this conversation, uh, is only one desire left then. That's God's desire. Okay. And we have it. Okay. We, we had, I think we had agape love before that moment in time. Because we were reflecting God's love back. Exactly. It was just like, like okay. a, a super mirror that just throws 100% back, in, back into God's face. Here's who we are. Okay. Desire. Could I get somebody to pass this out to everybody, if you would, please? That would be helpful. I'd like to go over this just a little bit, and then we're going to break, and then for 10 minutes or so like that, and then we're getting into the story of Joseph, more specifically in Egypt. What you have in your hand is actually coming out of my ref drive for my book. And I am suggesting the idea that Linda Gilkey has an idea that I think is worthy of more than just a little bit of study. If you'll look at where it says, selected key indicators of the idolizing of self apart from God. Man's morality or immorality consists of man's ultimate loyalty or concern, which provides his life its final security and meaning. Therefore, he gives his ultimate love and commitment to that. And what does he do? What's he giving it to? Self. Okay? Now, we could say that's desires or whatever the case may be. So now watch what happens here. uh, Number two, if anything should happen to the spiritual center, he feels that his life is radically insecure and totally incoherent. When a man gives his ultimate devotion to his own welfare or to his own group, he is no longer free to be completely moral or rational when he's under pressure. Does this sound like it's describing us as self? Okay, watch what happens here. Whenever that security of the object of this commitment is threatened, he is driven by an intense anxiety to reinforce the security. Okay, so what will happen is, is that, you know, when somebody challenges, there's that 
I've got to get my self-dignity or self-respect back at your expense. I, I, I can't let you win. I've got to win. I've got, you know, those are the things. I have to be right. Otherwise, I lose who I think I'm supposed to be. The ethical issues of humanity, human community life, are outward expressions of actions of more profound, more inward matters, we would say, religious issues. So in other words, when we look at our, our society around us, we are looking at things that are more than just simply society. It is a religious issue because the heart, as you pointed it out, is this idea that God says, you know, we have a heart like Christ. And you described all of the characteristics that we'd say, well, yes, I would agree with that. But then we don't see it in society. And what's really scary is this. Sin may be defined as the ultimate religious devotion to a finite interest. That means me. Okay? If I'm not doing it to somebody else who's bigger than all of us, I'm going to be looking out for me more than anybody else. And I'm going to screw things up. Because I want it my way. Because I have to have my little patch that says, this is me. Notice how self-image, self-worth, and self-identity is all wrapped up in self. From the deeper sin, sims the moral evils of indifference. Hey, I don't care about you because you're not important. I am. We talk about the idea of injustice. Well, I deserve justice at your expense. Does this sound like the newspaper? Okay. How about this? How about prejudice? Or even cruelty? How can somebody do this? You know, I'm sure you've heard of the old study that was done to see what, what you will do to somebody else if you're trying to teach them. And they had one person on the side of glass and they had a dial. And that dial was set up at, at in thing. And they said, when you press this button with that at certain things, that person's going to get a shock if they get the wrong answer. And you're supposed to get them to do it all the right thing. Okay, so they're sitting in there and they have the power over giving electrical shots to this person. Okay, and they're doing all this kind of stuff. And they're going up. Now, it says it as to how many volts that it is. Now what the person on the other side was, is that A, they were acting. What was on the dial, there were some of them that went all the way to the end of that dial. And if that had actually been electrical, it would have killed the person on the other side. But they acted. And there were people that, that got it all the way up. They said, you know, they, you have to get this. If I don't get this, then I'm not going to get the prize, or I'm not going to, or I'm going to have to do this, and it's going to be bad. I'm going to get penalized for it. I'm going to whatever it is. And they just sat there and they just kept going, kept going, kept going. He says, because you've got to get that. You've got to get that right. Can you see why we are so inhumane to one another? Because that's the rule of self. The only hope is the critical question, this is number nine, to what sort of deity are we ultimately loyal and what God claims our deepest love and devotion? If we don't live something outside of ourselves, I'm not responsible. I can do whatever I want. The only hope in the human situation is if men are to forget themselves enough to share with each other, and that's right back to what you said, the whole the human light was like, to be honest under pressure and to be rational and more sufficient to establish community. They must have some center of loyalty and devotion, some source of security beyond their own war welfare. Do you start realizing what this is describing? This is describing life today on planet Earth. God is honestly the only natural choice. If He is who He is, then He's the one. A man of genuine faith is one whose center of security and meaning lies not in his own life, but in the power and the love of God. Faith is an inward surrender and a loss of self-centeredness. The concern which transforms a man and frees him to be, to love truly. Here's the warning. A man may assent, say with his mind and his lips to even to the greatest truths, practice in his acts all the rules of righteousness and holiness and keep the center of concern fixed selfishly on his own bodily and spiritual warfare. 
we call them Pharisees. <laughs> but before we laugh too hard, Spirit of Prophecy, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 79. The spirit of Phariseeism is human nature. That has sobered me real fast. You know, we sing this song, I don't want to be a Pharisee. No, no, uh, uh, uh. The way we should be singing, I don't want to be a Pharisee anymore. What's this? Page 79. Page 79. And so you can see some of the observations that I made. You can look it over, whatever, that be that as it may. But I, I wanted to give you some ideas to start thinking. Because I'll be honest, when we start talking about human nature, it comes across to me, and I could be wrong, so somebody help me with this. But it, what it sounds like is that there's something wrong with actually my flesh. It doesn't, doesn't really talk about the way we say the mind, but we treat it as if I was born, then I'm all, I already have a sinful human nature. And so it's confusing as to how we actually talk about what I'm saying. What I see, and this is what I've shared before, is that it's the carnal mind. It's the carnal mind that makes whatever I do either sinful or not, selfish or not. Okay? And so with this kind of thing, for me, this explains to me how the mind is the whole problem. And the body just goes along with it. Go ahead. Uh, a baby is born. Yes. And a baby doesn't really know what's going on other than my diaper seems to smell and doesn't feel good. Is that a sin? My stu- my, no, no. My stomach, my stomach is growling, and I'm hungry. I'm a little chilly. Um, that water you put on me was, wasn't warm enough in the bath. Uh, these are all things about me as a, an infant. I'm, I'm only a couple of three days or a few weeks old, and it's, it's all about me until they start realizing, you know, learning how to smile, you know, uh, and do, do other little traits that people do when they're happy and they're being treated well it's just about me it's it simply about me so I, I believe we d- we start out from the womb thinking self because we don't know we're not trained yet by a loving parrot or two that there's a different way a better way okay yeah and and the the you know we could you know debate that back and forth the constituent I don't want to I, I think that the reason why something happens is the Jews always said that there was a time of cake, uh, accountability. That's what, it, that's what the uh, 12-year-old bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah is all about. And that, there was that kind of thing. And so I don't see that as a sin because the child just simply says, you know, I mean, that would be like saying, okay, I come over and I pinch you and you say, well, that hurts. Well, is that being selfish? Well, wait a minute. No, I'm just registering that pain is telling me that something's wrong. I need to address it. I don't think that's sin. I didn't say anything about feeling. Well, I know. Well, yeah, no, that's correct. Okay, but until they're able to make decisions, I don't think God holds them for that. Does that make sense? I don't know. I, I, I could be wrong, but I just, I'm simply saying the reason why I, I share this with you is because I think. As we saw earlier this today, is that it's the carnal mind that's the problem. It's repeated again and again, Romans 8, all of these other kinds of situations. And so it's changing of our mind and our desires to being something that is more other centered than self centered. And I think that's the issue that, that we deal with. Uh, there's, there's consequences of our selfish natures that we also have to get rid of. You know, because we get into habits and we start doing things like that. Okay, but I'm suggesting that, and the reason why I'm suggesting that is, is how only do we get salvation? By grace through faith. Yeah, absolutely. Now, here's the point: if it's by grace through faith, then what's changing? My physical feature, or my 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 felt. It's my mind that's changing. Okay, it's my mind that might change. Now, my body is going to cry out, you know, I've always done this or I've always eaten this and all of a sudden my appetites are a certain way. Well, 
I need to guide that with a new understanding of the way my, I'm thinking. That's how I get it. I'll help me with this. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I was going to mention about Romans 7 and 8, the dilemma that, that Paul describes there is you're faced with a choice between do you follow the law of God or do you follow the law of sin? And uh, we're presented with both. And since we have the power of choice, it makes it tough. But then he also points out a little bit later in the book of Romans, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers. In other words, it's a spiritual warfare that's more yeah. more than just the flesh on my body and what, what my stomach tells me at once. Correct. Now, the, part of the reason why, thank you, I appreciate it, Bruce, because the reason why I'm concerned about this is, is that when we start talking about last day events, then we're talking about meeting Jesus. Okay? And the problem is, is that we, I hear more times than not, and I'll tell you for sure, kids, kids this real quick. They get it real fast. Okay, what are the rules? What, what, is it, what does it take for me to get a passing grade so I get to go to heaven? Okay, well, and they start, so, well, you have to do this and this. You see where this goes? Real fast. It turns right into legalism every single time, you know. And the, my point being is, is this. If, in fact, the problem is the way that we think, if the way that it is, then when I give my, when I say that I am dying to self, which we actually, which by the way, I haven't heard too many sermons on that recently. Um, I don't know why, but I would like to think that maybe that would be more. But dying to self means I could do it this way, but I choose to do it this way because of the way God has treated me. God has treated me unselfishly. Okay? He does that kind of thing to me. And he says, wait a minute. He says, you know, but why does that work? He says, well, the sacrifice that he did for me breaks my heart when I actually think it through and say, you know what? He was there and he does this and this and this and he chose. Take a look at it's, uh, it's Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let's, let's just look at that for just a brief. And then I want to break a break and then we can get, get back here. Um, but let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Okay. It says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Okay. So whatever it is that Paul is saying, he says, well, you should be like this too. Okay. So let's take a look at it. Uh, where did my Bible go? Here it is. Okay, come on. Okay, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Okay, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. So as I understand it, okay, okay, who was in the form of God. Now, I don't know if we think about this, but God is completely in control, all that kind of situation. And you just go, that would be kind of like me becoming an ant. I don't know. I mean, just you understand where I'm going. I mean, to, to understand God, I mean, this just way up there. He is, he is God himself. He is the creator of all things. Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Does he have a problem with self-image and self-identity? He knows exactly who he is. But he, free choice, chooses to lower himself down. Take a look what he's willing to do. He sits there and he says, made himself of no reputation. Hey, aren't we worried about our reputations? All the time. I mean, you can get smeared so quickly anymore on internet or any of that kind of situation. And we say, well, you know, wait a minute, I don't want to do that. And we could say, well, if I do that, well, then, you know, Lord's not going to be, you know, uh, properly uh, seen or something like that. And we can still be selfish. Okay, I'm sorry to say that, but, but we're really good at this stuff. Okay? So he says, make himself of no reputation. He sits there and says, I don't care. And then he says, took up the form of a servant. Anybody seeing Elon Musk becoming a, uh, one of his workers? I don't think so. Or any other of these super elites. Okay? 
That's just human nature. Let's don't sit there and you know dump on them. I'm just simply saying when you get up to there and when you've worked your way up to these kinds of situations, you say, hey, you know, I, I won't lower myself. I'll have somebody else do it. We're, we're all of the same mind. It's just that we don't have the same resources that some people might have. But we're no different. Made in the likeness of men, being found in the fashion of he humbled himself to become obedient to death. Now, I don't know how we think about it. Because see, when I see death, I think just dying on a cross. That's, I, I'm sorry. And that's not right. We're talking the death that literally annihilates you. Okay? Consciously, he chose to be annihilated. Like he just doesn't exist. And he knows the distance from who he is as a human being and his Father in Heaven. And he sits there and he says, I'm willing to do this to get you back. And you start saying, wow. Why would you do that? He says, because that's just who I am. This is what I keep telling you. You were created for something much more than what you're thinking. And so when you start realizing that the change that is made here is that let this mind be in you. Okay. Have you ever seen something? I just sat down with, uh, I can't remember now. He, he was in uh, special services with the. Don? John. John. Yeah. He sat there and says, I struggle. I, I hope that I'm not doing anything. But he shared with me. He sat there and he says, you know, I have to re, re, think through the way I, I live my life. I mean, think about it. You're in special forces? I mean, I don't know, it's not SEAL, but I mean, I, I have friends who have been involved with SEAL, being a SEAL, Navy SEAL. These guys go, and they do everything, just like, you know, and they say, it is a hard transition to move from that mindset to a Christian mindset. <laughs> and let's face it, in, in degrees, maybe that's more extreme than you and I, but it's still the same thing. And we have to have our minds re, you know, start thinking, wait a minute, we have to do this and this and this. Have you ever found yourself having to sit there and say, you know, I need to rethink this. I need to re be born again, if you please, so that I look at this the way I know I should be and I'm just not doing it. See, and then, it, then the behavior follows that because the mind says, okay, let's do it that kind of. The mind is very egotistical, Bill, Bill, uh, Bill, uh, Cosby said, this is, this is the mind that says, as you're walking into your bath, uh, bedroom, so I don't, you don't have to turn the light. The toe says, turn the light on. We are not doing this again. And the knee says, I second the motion. Turn that light on. And the mind says, nope, I know my way around. We can do this. You see, this is, it's, just, it's so well you know, documented that that's the way we are as human beings. But when you start looking and saying, Jesus died. When you talk about love, you start looking at the sacrifice that Christ make. And you sit there and you go, I can't even fathom that. And he did it. He knew exactly what was going to happen to him. Yes? The most powerful word in that verse, the most powerful word in that verse is the first one, let. Yes. I, I'm so amazed how I don't have to go looking for this or, or work hard to somehow get that mindset or that mind frame. God's really to put it in me if I just let him do it. Yeah. See, in other words, it's something that we, he's asking. That's free will. That's free will. And so as we start seeing this, do you start recognizing that what God's looking for you isn't behavior? For first and foremost, he's looking for a different mind. And that mind will change behavior. Have you seen people that have been, quotes, converted? And they sit there and say, man, you should have seen what I was in here. Uh, I'm not somebody you want to mess with. You and all that kind of stuff. But they're different. That's conversion, people. That's, that's what we're asking one another to be in a church, to be able to evangelize to somebody the good news 
that God has shown us the way to reach what we really want, which is oneness and harmony with God and with my brother and sister. That's just, it's just that simple. But what we've done is we've turned it into a legalistic situation. It's okay. And so, we go, well, you've got to do this. And we get into this really quick when we start talking about the judgment. Okay? We've heard this kind of gone. I would like to challenge that with something that's a little bit different and comes from the story of Joseph. And so I'm going to stop right here and give you about a 10-minute break, and then we'll go back to it in that kind of situation and, and deal with that. Is that okay? Does that work for everybody? Because you're going to want to sit in on this one. Okay? All right?